Good evening and thanks for coming uh, to our harvesting and extracting webinar. I'm Shane Gebauer, I'm the general manager here at Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. And we've got a lot of stuff to cover this evening <clears throat> so that we can uh, get through all we need to talk about harvesting and extracting. Um, there's a, a couple of points we need to make here uh, before we get started. And, and there's lots of ways that you can produce honey without uh, doing things uh, using an extractor like I've got pictured right here, which is a motorized extractor that's uh, over $1,000. You certainly do not need uh, a piece of equipment such as this. Um, you can get away with doing things much uh, less expensive uh, than that. And we're going to touch a little bit on that, but I'm going to really focus on doing liquid honey. Although uh, I'll mention a bit uh, about comb honey, which is a way of harvesting honey um, and uh, does not require an extractor. Um, uh, but I'm not really going to focus on that. Uh, we're going to focus on getting uh, honey out of the comb so that your bees have that wax to reuse either for a later flow or um, for a, uh, the following season. So let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about how um, you're going to get the, uh, the honey off the bees, how you're going to harvest it. Um, the, uh, the, um, the, the, there's a couple options available to you. Um, there are, uh, in descending order, uh, in terms really in price, we've got... Uh, or I should say ascending order in terms of price, the bee brush, which is about $5, uh, the, the escape screen, uh, which is uh, oh, around 10 uh, and then the fume pad, which is about the same price, but you need something to apply uh, to that pad to uh, sort of cause the bees to vacate the honey super. Now, on this slide here, I've got a couple of things. Um, let me just point out some, some, some of those things that I've got. Of course, I've got a frame of honey. This is uh, a frame of capped honey. Um, it's a little difficult to see, but you'll notice along this top uh, bar here, uh, let me get clear out the, the marker, along this top bar here, you'll see that the, the comb has been drawn out well beyond the top bar. And that's because we're running seven frames in an eight frame uh, super. And the advantage of that is that uh, as the bees uh, build that comb, as they store their, their nectar in there and cure that nectar into honey, they draw that wax out beyond the top bar, and in just about every single uncapping device out there will uh, benefit from that. It will be easier to uncap this frame uh, because that comb is drawn out beyond the top bar. So if you're running eight frame equipment, it's, it's good to have uh, just seven frames in there. Or if you're running ten frame equipment, just have nine frames in there and it makes it a little easier to uncap. Now, it's worth mentioning that uh, if you're just getting started, if you're a brand new beekeeper, and you're starting with brand new equipment, so the bees have not worked uh, these frames uh, before this season, put all the frames in the box, whether it be all eight or all ten, until they have comb drawn out. Uh, what will happen is there will be too much space in between the frames if you short, it, if you short that box by one. Uh, and that will result in bees doing things that they ought not to do. So if you're brand new equipment, start off with uh, all 10 or all 8 frames, but if you've got these frames from previous years, uh, you can uh, run one shy and, and it'll be much better off. Now the other thing that I've got here is, is this contraption right here. Um, it, this is called a, a refractometer, and its sole purpose is to test the moisture content of honey. Uh, why is that important? Well, uh, it's important because honey essentially does not spoil if your moisture level is below a certain threshold. And that threshold is 18%. It's actually 18.6, but we'll say 18%. Uh, what happens at that magic number is there simply is not enough water in the honey for things like bacteria and yeast to actually survive. So it sort of becomes a virtual desert uh, for those organisms. Um, and so if you've got honey that's properly cured, that's below 18%, it, it will store 
uh, essentially forever. They have found honey in Egyptian tombs that have uh, that, that was cured properly, has the required uh, moisture level, and is still fine today. It's it's granulated, it's a solid, but still um, still in good shape that you could liquefy it and consume it. Um, so that's why we've got here this this item right here, uh, refractometer to test the moisture content. Um, it's it's well worth uh, the investment to pick something like this up. Maybe you've got a beekeeper you can borrow one from. Maybe you're you're friends with a beekeeper and you can split the cost. But there's nothing worse than uh, going through all season long working so hard with your bees and having them work so hard to produce a crop of honey, uh, only to find out that uh, once you're all done harvesting and it's sitting in the jars um, or a pail or something, when you open up that jar and you hear sort of a, a from the fermentation, that, that fizz sound uh, from the pressure, um, you don't want that. So um, something like this is, is very good to have. Now, if you're out in the field collecting your honey, this picture is a little blurry, but what I tried to describe uh, in a previous webinar is, is the frame shake method. Um, and what that is, is if you've got a frame that does not, uh, that the honey is not capped, and you want to know if it's cured properly, whether you should take this frame back to your honey house or not, you can do the frame shake method. Now this is just, let me, let me be very careful here. This is just a generalization. By no means is this a definitive test to assess the moisture content of honey. The only way to do that is with a refractometer. But you, what you do with the frame shake test um, is you hold a frame like this, and in a sharp downward motion, you shake that frame. And what will happen is if the honey is cured properly, if it's below 18%, the honey will stay, the nectar will stay, well, it's honey at that point, will stay in the cells. If it's above 18%, you'll see uh, drops of, of nectar that have flung out and uh, landed on right here, which is a, either your cover, your inner cover. Uh, in this case, it's a, an escape screen. Um, so do a quick snap of the wrist in a downward motion really quick like this and, and jerk that frame with a good snap of the wrist and see if anything comes out. If, if it does... Uh, leave that behind. If it doesn't, it's safe to uh, it's safe to take it. Generally speaking, the other thing that uh, the other rule of thumb that that I have is that if if uh, a frame is two thirds of the way capped, that uh, the unthird uncapped portion usually is cured as well. It's just the bees haven't gotten there uh, just yet. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the harvesting techniques. Um, we've got the bee brush. I mentioned it's it's uh, about uh, five dollars. It's certainly the most inexpensive way to harvest honey. And basically, what you want to do is um, you want to uh, have a, an empty super, which I've got right here. And in this case, I'm using an escape screen on top of it. But you could use a piece of plywood. You could use your inner cover as long as uh, you covered up the oval in the center. And this is just to help seal this box. Uh, as I'm transferring frames from the hive into this empty box. Um, so you just want to be able to cover it up because as you stack up all of these supers, there's one, there's two, uh, and then I think this one we're getting down into the brew chamber. But as you transfer these frames over, uh, you might get a robbing situation, and it's nice to be able to seal this stack up to prevent bees from getting in. Okay, And the, the whole premise of this is uh, this empty box here. You take one frame out at a time, you sweep the bees off, you sweep them into the box, and then you transfer this frame into your empty box. And that's it. Uh, and you just keep one frame at a time, moving it over into the empty box. Now, once you've moved, in this case, once you've moved all of the, uh, all of the frames over, uh, now this box here is empty, uh, and now this this empty box can go on top of your stack, and now the frames that are down here, you can start moving into that second empty box, and so you just sort of leapfrog them. So all you need to do is start with one empty super, and, and then you can sort of leapfrog the empty supers uh, as you progress through that uh, 
the brushing process. Now, you want to be gentle as you brush the bees. You don't want to be very harsh with them. Uh, you don't want to damage the bees uh, by any stretch. Just a nice gentle sweep into the box. And, and that's really all there is to it. Um, you're never going to get 100% of the bees off your supers. You're always going to bring a few back with you. Um, you should be aware of that. Okay? So that's the bee brush. The, this, the, the escape screen um, uh, is my method of har the pr my preferred method of harvesting. I am amazed at how well this thing works every single time I use one. Um, it its whole premise is that here's here's one on a uh, on a stack uh, or on a hive. These are actually uh, this one here and this super here are actually uh, they've got frames, but they're empty frames. And we're getting ready. This was uh, in preparation for the sourwood flow. So what I've done is, is these supers right here, I have pulled off of this hive, put empties. These are empties. And now I'm going to restack these so that as the bees move from these full supers, they'll move down into my empty supers in preparation for the sourwood flow. It's a good idea to give some extra space underneath for those bees uh, vacating those full supers. Now, this is, this is my escape screen. Now, this is one side of it. This is just the hole right here. All there is is it's, oh, I don't know, maybe a two, two and a half, three inch hole in, in a piece of plywood on one side. The other side, the side that's facing down, is this triangle contraption here. And the premise is that as a bee comes through this, through this uh, hole in the center, it walks until it hits something, and then it walks, and then it turns, and then it and and then it walks, and then it turns, and it walks out of the uh, the um, it walks out of this trap. Um, and if it tries to come, let me clear my my drawing here. If it tries to come back through, what happens is it sort of comes in. It 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 doesn't encounter a barrier, so it just sort of follows the wall here, and then whoops, and then pokes it back out the side. And so it never actually makes it into this inner area to get back through the, uh, the hole and then now back up into your honey supers. It works amazingly well. Every single time that someone said, oh, those things don't work for the hoot, if you ask them uh, and sort of uh, find out a little bit more information, what's happened is they put this triangle facing up. And what that does is essentially trap the bees in the honey supers. You want to make sure that the, the, uh, the triangle is facing down or the triangle is facing the, uh, the direction in which you want the bees to go. So they're going to come from the, the whole side through the triangle and they won't be able to get back up. When you uh, pull off um, uh, the supers and look down through this hole, you will see a bunch of bees uh, on this side of the screen right here that they just can't figure out to come around and walk straight through like that. It works very, very well. Now, let me back up a, a little bit more, or let me say something else about this, rather, that um, here is the, the hive that uh, is in this picture right here. I've got two brood chambers in this, in this picture. You can see, you can make out a, a queen excluder uh, right there. Um, and what I've done is stacked, I've stacked two empty honey supers that the bees can move down into as they vacate these three supers up here. Um, when I pulled these super, these three supers off originally, let me see if I can describe this well enough. Uh, let, let's take a look at this right here. See how there's some wax? on the top bars of this of this super. Well, that wax is attached to the bottom bars of the super above it. And they store honey in those cells. So when you break apart these supers, you break apart those cells. And so you get honey dripping. Now, if I were using a fume pad, which we'll talk about in a second, I'm just going to take this super off and, and bring it back to my honey house, which means honey is going to be dripping from these cells that I've broken open. With, a, with an escape screen, 
I'm going to come to this hive. Uh, it's about 24 hours in advance for every super I'm trying to empty. So I've got one, two, three, 24 hours times three. Honestly, I've never had to wait more than 48 hours. So I'm going to come here. I'm going to pull them off like I've done here, put my escape screen on, restack my supers, and come back in about two days, and these will be empty. But now when I unstack them, I'm going to keep track. Let's say here's my front of this one, and when I restack, if this, if, if, uh, if this super was number one, and this was number two, and this was number three, I want to keep track of which, which was the front side of each one. So I'll put this one so that this is the front side as I took it off. Now this one, I want the front side to be back here. So originally, the, I had my front here matched with my front. When I restack them, I want my front here, and my, now the front of my back one, or my second super, toward the back. And the reason for that is that now these cells that are between these two supers don't match up with one another anymore. And so what will happen is rather than the bees repairing the cells, they'll clean the cells and any honey that was dripping from them will be taken care of when I come back 48 hours later and pull these supers off. Uh, uh, it's, it's sort of difficult to explain. Hopefully I've, I've made my point well enough. So now this, so like I said, uh, this is the front uh, before I took, put, this is the front before I unstack these supers. Um, and I'm putting the front here, the front of the second super toward the back, and the front of the third super toward the front. So that, that way I've sort of crisscrossed them, and now my cells don't line up. The bees will clean that honey up, and I don't have as much a mess in my honey house, which for most of us is our kitchen, uh, when I'm going to extract these, these frames. Um, Hopefully that's clear. That's one of the real nice features about this, uh, this escape screen. Not to mention that you buy the equipment once. You don't need to buy any sort of fumigant or anything like that that you need with a, um, with a, uh, um, a, uh, a fume pad. And the bee brush, uh, you don't need, uh, you don't agitate the bees. You don't, dam you don't run the risk of damaging your bees uh, with this escape screen like you do the bee brush. My preferred method. Very, very nice. Works extremely well. Very nice. Okay, let's talk about the fume pad. The fume pad, uh, the whole premise of the fume pad is that um, you've got, uh, it looks a lot like a, uh, a telescoping top. Okay, here's the fume pad. With the exception that on the inside is a felt material. Um, and rather than sort of coming down over the sides of a honey super, it actually sits right on top uh, of the super to create a seal. Um, what you do is you take Bego or Fisher's Bee Quick and apply some to, uh, to this, this felt material, and then you put this on top of your supers and it will vacate one super at a time. There's a lot of variables that go into uh, dictating how well or how fast these things work. A nice warm sunny day uh, with the sun. You can't see it, but the top of this is made of an aluminum sheet. The sun beating down on that aluminum evaporates the Bego or the Be Quick a little faster, causes it to settle through the super a little faster, therefore it vacates the bees a little faster. If it's a cool overcast day, it's not going to work as, as fast uh, as a sunny day. You can put one of these on a hive. It usually takes about 15 minutes for your first one under good conditions. Uh, about 15 minutes for your first honey super to be emptied. If you've got 10, let's say you've got 10 or 20 hives lined up, you might put out four of these on the first four hives. Uh, you come, you pull this super off, you put the fume pad then on top of this super down here, uh, and then you can go to the next hive, do the same thing. And once you're done harvesting all the honey from this hive, you can take this fume pad and move it to the fifth hive in the sequence if, you're, if you've got uh, five, four fume pads. So you can sort of leapfrog them that way. Now, this, this, works, this works really well. Uh, I, I have uh, a little bit of a, a, a problem with this in that Bego, frankly, stinks. 
I mean, it smells really, really bad. Um, sort of, uh, it's, it's a combination between, oh, oh, let's just call it what it is. It's a combination between baby vomit and skunk smell, probably. Um, and it will get on, whether you get it on you or not, the smell will, uh, you'll carry it with you. It's really not a very pleasant thing. Be Quick, Fisher's Be Quick, is much more pleasant in terms of odor, works just as well. But with this, you've got a, a with this method, you've got a $10 fume pad, and here you've got about another, oh, $10, $14 or so for one of these products. Um, so for that, you can actually pick up one or two uh, escape screens and be done with it and reuse those uh, time and time again. So... Uh, but it works well. This works very well if, you do, if you've got uh, remote uh, apiaries. Maybe the hives are not in your backyard. And so making two trips like you need to make with an escape screen isn't very practical. You need to go to your yard, harvest your honey, and be done with it. In that case, either the fume pad or the bee brush is the way to go. Okay? Um, there we are with the, uh, the fume pad. Now let's talk a little bit. Those are really uh, the methods of, of uh, harvesting your honey. Now let's talk a little bit about extracting honey. Uh, I've already talked about comb honey. Comb honey, essentially, uh, it's a special foundation where you let your bees build your own foundation. You actually cut it from the, the frame, uh, and then you put, uh, put it in a, uh, a cassette or a clamshell uh, box or something like that and keep the honey in the comb. Um, you don't need any extractors, you don't need any sort of uncapping devices or anything like that. It's a very easy, simple way to get into uh, the honey. Um, the problem is that comb honey is sort of a, a niche market. Uh, not a lot of people nowadays actually like comb honey. There's still some people that really seek it out. Um, and, and if you're just using it for your own purposes and you like comb honey, that's the way to go. But I'm going to focus on liquid honey. And the whole goal of, of liquid honey, the benefit of, of extracting liquid honey, is that you get these frames with drawn comb that you can reuse either for a later flow or next year's crop. And the reason for that is that all we're doing is shearing a very thin layer uh, off the outside of that comb. The layer of cappings, that's all we're trying to remove. You don't want to take more than that because you're taking comb that now the bees have to rebuild to start storing honey. The less wax you take, the less work your bees have to do to start storing honey again. The less work they've got to do, the more honey you're going to get. It takes about seven pounds of liquid honey to, um, it takes about seven pounds of liquid honey to produce a pound of wax. So it's, it's advantageous uh, to just slice this very thin cappings. And this is sort of the prized wax. If you're a candle maker, this is the stuff you're going to want to make candles with. If you like lip balms and soaps, this is the stuff that you're going to want to make lip balms and soaps with because it's a very light colored wax. It produces a very clean, very pretty colored wax that's good for candle burning and, and, uh, and lotions and lip balms and soaps, etc. Okay, so let's talk a little bit uh, about how we get this liquid honey uh, from the, the frames um, into uh, a bottling bucket. Let's talk about a sort of a general setup. Now, this is a fairly lavish setup. There's no way around. Uh, um, there, but you don't need all of these things. Here's my stack of supers that I'm going to uh, extract um, the honey from. This is a, a bottling tank. Uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> an uncapping tank. Sorry about that. that is, this is an uncapping tank. Underneath my finger here is a nail that's sticking up that you'll see in later slides is a way to balance the frame. What happens is as you slice the cappings off, it falls down into this tank, and you can see this nylon mesh. Uh, and, and at the bottom of this tank here, there is uh, a stainless steel perforated sheet of metal that uh, allows for honey to drain through into this bottom 
bottom tank. And what you can't see right down here at the very bottom is a gate, a bottling gate. So you can actually uncap honey, uh, uncap your frames. Uh, any honey that drips out of those frames will drain through and you can bottle it in this bottom tank. You could also use this as a filtering unit if you'd like. But you can do, you can use a lot of different things for an uncapping tank. You can use uh, maybe a, like a turkey roasting pan or something like that. Just something to catch the cappings and the honey as you slice them uh, from the frame. It doesn't have to be anything fancy like this. Um, but if you're going to use uh, plastic, just make sure that uh, it is food grade. Uh, a lot of um, plastic Rubbermaid type containers actually have um, uh, deodorizers embedded in the plastic. Um, and you don't want to be using any of that. Okay, so we've got our uncapping tank. We've got our, our extractor. This happens to be a nine frame hand crank radial. Um, it's probably one of our most popular extractors. Um, and then in the background here, I've got a very nice, very large um, bottling tank. This holds, I think this is our 660, it'll hold 660 pounds uh, worth of honey. Um, and I've got a, another uh, strainer on the top, with, again, with another nylon mesh bag. And really, these nylon mesh bags are, are sufficient to get anything out of your honey that you're going to want to get at. In fact, pantyhose, clean, clean pantyhose uh, are an excellent way to uh, filter your honey. We get a lot of questions about how do I filter my honey. Um, the easy solution is something like this. It's not a very fine filter. You don't need any sort of pressure behind the honey to force it through this, this nylon. Uh, same with a, a pantyhose. You don't need a whole lot of pressure to force uh, the honey through those through the nylons. Um, it's going to remove most of the wax that's in there. What wax may make it through this into my bottling tank here, uh, gravity will take care of for me. Leave your honey in a bottling tank for about 48 hours. All the wax will float to the top. All gates on bottling tanks, you can't see this behind the extractor, but they're all located at the base so that you're drawing honey from the lower parts of the tank. So if this tank were filled up to here with uh, honey, all my wax would be on top of it. So all from here down to the gate would be clear honey that you could bottle. So gravity uh, and, and just something as simple as this nylon or pantyhose or something like that are all you really need to filter, quote unquote, filter your honey. Uh, you don't need anything else uh, than that. That's all, that's all you'll need. So we've got our capping tank, an extractor, and a bottling tank. We already talked about ways you could shortcut the uncapping tank. The bottling tank could be as simple as a five gallon bucket with a gate on the bottom. Um, again, just make sure that it's a, a food approved plastic bucket, not something that you got from a paint store or something like that that you washed out. Make sure it's a good clean pail. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about extractors in a second, but let's talk right now about uncapping tools. The first thing you want to do is keep your honey as warm as possible. Um, you don't want to tuck it down in, in a cool, dark place in your basement uh, until you can get to it. Keep it warm uh, because that, of course, lets honey flow out of the frames a little easier. Um, and you want to remove, like I said before, remove as little of the cappings as possible and ensure your moisture is low. Um, test it. What I do is I'll extract a frame of honey and test almost immediately to see to make sure that my moisture is low. Now, if you've got a 15% a moisture content and you've got one or two frames out of, uh, out of 50 that uh, have 19% moisture content, you can extract those because they're what the, the moisture that they're going to contribute to your overall harvest is not going to bring you up over that 18.6%. So you can sort of, you know, buffer yourself a little bit that way. But you want to uh, keep your honey warm. You want to remove as little of the cappings as possible, and you want to make sure your moisture is, is, is low. The other thing that I want to mention here is once you harvest your honey, 
don't store it for more than three to four days. And the reason for that is if you're in any area that's got small hive beetle, which it, it, the hive beetle has made its way around. It's, it's got a pretty broad geographic reach now. If you're in an area with small hive beetle, the bees generally take care of the hive beetle and don't let it get out of control in the hive. But now you've brought empty or you brought supers that are empty of bees back to your house, your honey house, your kitchen, wherever, that may have a hive beetle in it and no bees to keep it in check. So if you harvest your honey and then just let it set for a week, that beetle can run amok in your in your equipment and create an awful, awful mess. Um, so harvest and uh, extract within three to four days after you harvest. This is our first tool that I want to cover. This is an uncapping fork or, an, or a capping scratcher. It looks a lot like a comb, a little pointed tines here. You can use this to uncap your, your, uh, your frames if you'd like. This is, I think, $6. We've got one that's, that's really quite expensive. We call it the, the, uh, the scratchinator. It'd be the last uncapping fork you'd buy. But this one will get, by, uh, get you by. What you do is you slide these tines just underneath the cappings and then sort of rock down on the, the handle using this area as a pivot point and it just sort of scoops the, uh, the cappings right, from the, right off the frame. Really, most people just use this to sort of get into the corners of a frame or something like that that some other capping device, uncapping device, hasn't uh, been able to reach, whether it be a knife or something like that. And they just go through and sort of rake the, uh, the cells uh, that were missed by the other uncapping device. But it's five, six bucks, and all you would really need to uncap a frame. Uh, it would take a while, but you could do it. Um, we've got heated tools. Um, this is a, uh, an electric uh, plane. Uh, here you can see that nail I mentioned uh, in that crossbar of the uncapping tank. And the whole premise here is now some people hold frames differently. Uh, it's sort of personal preference. You'll figure out what works well for you. But basically, um, this is a heating element right here. And what you can't see is uh, riding along the surface of the frame is a blade that is connected to the heating element. So as you drag this down, you're basically taking this layer. You can sort of see it curling up inside the plane, you're taking a layer of cappings wax off of the, um, off of the frame. Um, this over here is a heated knife, and same idea, just sort of slicing down, uh, just trying to remove as little wax as possible to open up those cells. This is why, here's a very good example right here of why it's nice to run one frame short in your equipment because the bees have built this comb out beyond my top bar so I can use that top bar right here as a guide as I slide my knife down. So I can ride my knife right along the edge of that top bar um, and slice my cappings off and you can see they did the same down here on the bottom bar. So it makes it very easy to uncap whereas if they uh, didn't draw it out beyond the top bar, I'd have to sort of get, get in there a little bit more, and it's, it's harder to do. Um, so that's why it's nice to have the bees uh, draw out uh, beyond the top and bottom bar. Now, of these two, I've tried them both. Um, if I'm using a heated uh, tool, uh, I prefer the plane myself. Um, if you're going to go with a, a heated knife, uh, we've got a... Um, Two that are uh, available, we've got a, uh, a Speed King and a, um, a Master uncapping knife. The Speed King uh, is, is um, uh, probably the one that I would recommend. Um, make sure you read the instructions because there is sort of a startup cycle that needs to be followed when you're using uh, the, the knife. And if you don't follow it, you run the risk of damaging the, the knife. So make sure if you get one of these, you read the instructions. These are, the knives are a little over $90, $90 the hand plane about $125. So we're starting off uh, with sort of the higher end uh, stuff. But um, 
you can use something like a cold knife. And, and honestly, these things work great. Um, it's got a, uh, a serrated edge on both sides, and, and you just sort of use it like a, uh, a saw almost where you just sort of uh, slice down, you know, in a, in a sort of a sawing motion, back and forth, down the frame, and, and you just take that outer layer of wax off, uh, like we've been talking about. Now, some people say you can't get a good uncappings with a, uh, a cold knife. Well, here is that layer of wax that I've taken off with a, with a cold knife, um, and, and that's great, I think. Uh, it's a very thin layer of wax, worked very well. And these, these are about uh, $20, $19.95. Um, you, you, for the price, you can't beat it. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're money conscious, which most of us are nowadays, uh, a cold knife is the way to go. I'd prefer, I'd recommend a cold knife over an uncapping fork. Um, and if you're if you're gonna if you want to go for something that's electric, go for uh, I suggest the plane. I like I like the plane, but this thing works really really well. Okay. Now the uh, um, one of the uh, the last options for uncapping probably is outside the realm of most of us on the uh, on the, uh, the the call here on in, in this session. This is a sideliner uncapper. Basically, these are sort of pizza cutters, if you will, that as the frame gets cranked through, they, they make all these vertical uh, incisions in the capping. So it doesn't actually remove any wax as much as it just slices down the cappings. Uh, and then once you put it inside your extractor, those uh, cappings sort of fling open like shutters uh, on a window and allow the honey to flow out. And here's a frame that's gone through the sideliner on capper and then extract it. This uh, is, is over $1,000, probably beyond most people that are listening in right now. But it's, if, if you can afford it, this thing is really, really nice. Uh, but I think most of us probably looking at that cold knife for about 20 bucks, and it works really well. Before we get into uh, extractors, one of the most important thing that you can keep in mind uh, when you're extracting is to keep your honey gate open. Um, the reason for that is that uh, the honey gate's at the bottom of the extractor. As the, uh, the frames spin and honey gets flung, uh, the honey, if the gate were closed, the honey level would keep creeping up, creeping up, creeping up, creeping up, until it reaches the basket that contains the frames. It's holding the frames, and it will bog down your motor, or if you're hand cranking, it's going to get really tough to spin that basket. So keep your gate open while you're extracting so the honey can flow out and does not build up inside your extractor. Um, here's a, another type of, of strainer. This is a stainless steel double sieve. Um, it has two uh, sieves, this one right here and then this one right here. This is a coarse filter. And then this is a, a finer filter that the honey can, can flow uh, through. And this is just a stainless steel five-gallon bucket that we're using as our, as our bottling bucket. All right. Um, let's uh, talk about one of the most popular extractors that we've got. Uh, Nine-frame radial extractor. Now, what does it mean, a radial extractor? Uh, versus another type of extractor called a tangential extractor. Um, basically, a radial extractor, the frames are placed in it uh, much like spokes on a wheel. So here's a spoke, here's a spoke, and here's, here's our wheel. Okay? Uh, top bars, notice the top bars are all facing out. And the reason why our top bars are all facing out is that when the bees build... Uh, their comb, they don't build them uh, so they come off straight. The cells don't come off straight uh, off that foundation. They actually angle them. This is exaggerated. They angle them like this. They angle them up so that when they're storing nectar in those cells, it doesn't run out of the cell. It actually runs into the cell until it's thick enough uh, that it, it won't flow out regardless of the angle. 
Um, and it, and it's, it's about 13 degrees. You've got about a 13 degree angle uh, which these cells are angled up. Uh, and so that's why we put our top bars to the outside. So as this thing spins, the force uh, exerted on that frame and thus the honey in that frame is toward the outside and flings out uh, against the outside of the extractor. That's a radial extractor. A tangential extractor, the frames don't get loaded in like spokes on a wheel, rather they get loaded in like this. They're, they're loaded flat, so only one side of the frame extracts at a time. Because the other side, all your force is this way, so one, all the force is being applied to one side of the frame, uh, and the other side, uh, the honey is allowed to flow out. Um, radial extractors um, are generally a little bit faster in terms of uh, net, or net time in extracting a frame um, because you don't have to reverse them. Uh, this, this extractor will do both sides of the frame at one time because the force is this way, so honey will flow out both sides of the frame. If you've got a tangential, what's going to happen is you'll extract one side of the frame, you'll have to stop the extractor, spin the frame to do the other side. So it, a, a tangential will extract one side of a frame faster than a radial can do both sides of a frame, uh, uh, but you've got to flip uh, that, that frame in a tangential, so it actually will take longer. Uh, so for example, it might take two minutes to do one side of a frame in a tangential. Uh, it might take three minutes to do an entire frame in a radial, but you, in that tangential, you've got to do the, uh, that frame twice, so it's actually four minutes to uncap that, uh, or rather extract that frame. So uh, radial extractors a little bit faster. This is where, too, keeping your honey warm will be to your benefit because it will flow from these frames uh, a little bit faster, a little bit easier. How long, this is the question that we always get. There's actually a couple questions we always get about extractors. How long do I need to spin this thing? Um, and and uh, if I've got X number of hives, what size extractor do I need? Let's take the first one. Um, how long do you need to spin this thing? Uh, depends a little bit on the temperature of the honey. If it's, if it's warm, it'll flow out faster. If it's cool, it'll flow out slower, so you'll need to spin it longer. Generally speaking, five or so minutes, maybe may five to ten minutes, and you'll have a pretty good uh, extracted frame uh, with, this, with this extractor. Now, the next question is, what size extractor, what type of extractor should I get if I've got X number of hives? Um, if you've got... Um, uh, if you've got five or less hives, you can get away with our next extractor, which is our Compact Deluxe. If you've got five or more, uh, if you've got between five and ten, you can get away with a Compact Deluxe, but really, whew, that's a lot of work with this thing. This this will only do this will do four medium frames at one time, and again, you've got to flip those frames to get both sides extracted. Um, so you can see how this frame's being loaded in here, how it's sort of parallel to this center bar, whereas before in this extractor, um, they're, they're being loaded in like this, okay? So that's, uh, this is a tangential extractor. So if you've got five hives or less, you can get away with this one. If you're between five and ten, uh, you could still get away with this one, but really for me, ooh, that'd be pushing the limits. Uh, if you've got ten hives or more, uh, definitely start thinking about uh, going with a nine frame. Um, if you're up, you know, anytime you can get a motorized, you're going to be bene uh, you're going to benefit because the uh, the hand cranks. You've got a pretty big bicep if you've got uh, a lot of honey to extract uh, by the time you're all done. Um, so uh, the the uh, motorized would be advantageous if you've got maybe 15 to 20 hives. But you could still do a hand crank. You could do hand crank all the way up to 100 hives. You could do 100 hives even with the compact deluxe, but it's going to take you a real long time. 
Um, so the uh, if you've got five or less, this would be a, a good uh, a good option for you. Um, this, as I said, does four medium frames. It'll do two deeps uh, at one time. You've got to flip your frames because it only does one side at a time. The nice thing about this Compact Deluxe, we also have an extractor called the Compact, in which the extractor is the same, except the Compact Deluxe has some extra components. Um, it sits, uh, here's the extractor in the background, it sits on top of a bottling tank that's got handles, and uh, between the extractor and the bottling tank goes this sieve. And here's a, a blow-up of that sieve after we've extracted some honey. So what happens is as you are extracting in your uh, extractor, the honey spins out, flows down through holes that are in the bottom of the extractor, through this sieve down into your bottling pail, now and which has a gate on it, which you can just make out right there. Now, in this case, you want to make sure you keep your gate closed because this is going to serve as your reservoir, uh, and you're, it's going to take a lot of honey to fill this and make it up into the extractor uh, before it starts to bog down the uh, the basket in there. Um, so this is sort of a nice self-contained unit, and you can so you get a bottling pail, you get a sieve, an extractor, all in one. Uh, and, and this extractor, uh, the Compact Deluxe, I'll just throw out some some prices here, so we sort of have a sense of what we're talking about. The Compact Deluxe is three thirty-five. The uh, the Compact which again is just this extractor. It doesn't come with the sieve or the tank. It's actually on legs, uh, an extractor on legs. That one is 245. And then the hand crank, the nine frame hand crank, this one back here, this is uh, 425. And then it gets more expensive as you start to get up into uh, the motorized, which, which probably most of us listening are not going to be uh, interested in. One of these would be a very good option for, for y'all. Um, and here are some motorized uh, versions. This is a nine frame. It's the same extractor as that hand crank, except it's got a motor mounted on top. This is uh, sort of a deluxe extractor. It's a 20 frame motorized. It's got a reversible motor uh, and some other bells and whistles. But these are, you know, this one's this one's over a thousand. Uh, the nine frame is motorized. Is seven seven eighty five. Pretty pricey. Um, and, and beyond the scope of most of us here. So you, we'd really be looking at the Compact Deluxe or the, the 9 frame. Okay? And here is uh, uh, an extracted frame. This is our end goal, that uh, we've, we've taken that layer of cappings off, and we've kept mo a good portion of the comb intact. Yes, there's a couple of little scraped up areas there, um, that the bees will need to work on, but basically we can put this back on the hive uh, if we're if we're going after a later flow and the bees can start utilizing it right away, or uh, this will be ready to go for next season. Now the next question that I'm sure uh, has popped into many people's minds: What do I do with these frames once I've extracted them? Uh, well, let's say for for a moment that. Uh, we are doing what we talked about earlier, which is pulling honey off, the spring honey uh, off in preparation of the sourwood flow, or spring honey off in preparation of a summer flow or goldenrod flow, whatever the case may be, wherever you're located. You can uh, take these frames and you can put them right back on the hive and, for the bees to, to refill. Um, they'll clean them up, they'll repair the comb, they'll start filling them out, no problems. The other option that you can do is take them, and, and there's a lot of people that may frown upon this, but uh, what I do is I take them far away from where my beehives are, and I stack them up on a, uh, a piece of, uh, inside a, uh, an inner cover, or rather a, a telescoping top or something like that, and let the bees clean them up. They'll rob them out and clean them up. And any wax that, uh, that they sort of tear off, you know, like these little flakes of wax right here, I want to save that so when they're cleaning them up, because I've got it stacked in inside a, a telescoping top, the wax falls down into my telescoping top and I can save the wax. You can put it on a sheet, 
you can you can put these on a sheet, you can put it on a piece of plywood, something to catch that wax so you don't waste it. Uh, and the reason why you want to take these far away if you're going to let the bees clean them up is because you'll create a quite a frenzy of bees trying to to clean up all this honey. Uh, once you've done that, if you want to store them for the long haul, um, there's something called paramoth that you can use to discourage um, uh, wax moth from getting into these these frames during winter time. If you're in the north, uh, store them outside where it gets below 32 degrees. Anything below 32 degrees kills all form of wax moth. And so you can store them outside under cover uh, so that you can preserve them that way. If you're in the south where you don't really get uh, that cold snap early enough before wax moth can do damage, uh, paramoth is an option. But what, I, what I've done here is uh, I use a, uh, a queen excluder. So I've got basically wax. No pollen here. Uh, there's, there's no, um, there's really nothing for the wax moth uh, because all this honey will be cleaned up by the robbing bees. And I've just stacked them outside with a cover, uh, even here in North Carolina, and didn't have a problem with wax moth in my honey supers. If you tried to do that with a brood chamber, there is sufficient food in a brood chamber that uh, the wax moth could be a problem here in the south, would be a problem here in the south. But uh, this works uh, just uh, letting them clean them up, let the bees clean them up, uh, and storing them outside works well. All right, let's see where we are. That is, um, I've been going on now for uh, about a little over 50 minutes. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, so let me uh, let me just clean up my my screen here a second, and oops, go back to this, and let me take a look at what we got for questions. All right. Um, is it wise to harvest more than once? I'm in Central North Carolina. Um, the uh, here's here's the thing uh, about harvesting multiple times. Uh, it's a little bit more work because right? you're harvesting twice and, or three or four times instead of just once at the end of the season. Um, but uh, generally speaking, uh, you'll get more honey if you harvest uh, more than once because when you take the honey that first time or the second time, it sort of stimulates the hive to uh, work a little harder. Now that projects a little bit uh, of, of human uh, thought and emotion to them, but really that's sort of what happens. Uh, and so they'll produce overall a larger honey crop if you harvest more than once. The other nice thing about harvesting more than once is that you can segment your honey harvest. You know, I mentioned spring honey. I mentioned sourwood honey. I've mentioned goldenrod honey. You can, uh, by, based on when you harvest and what equipment you give them to fill, you can isolate those various crops. So if you're... Um, if you're uh, selling at a farmer's market, you can sell spring honey, summer honey, and fall honey, three different products. Uh, and each one definitely will have a different taste. If you're uh, just giving it away as gifts, uh, you can give away those three different gifts. Uh, if you're using it for baking, each one will have a different taste and flavor to it and impart different characteristics to your baked goods. Um, if you're making meat, each one will impart a different flavor to your mead. So there's a lot of advantage to sort of segmenting uh, your harvest that way to get those different variety or those different uh, types of honeys. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I like harvesting more than once, but it a lot depends on uh, your time constraints as well and, and uh, your the ease at which you can extract and, and schedules and such such as that. Um, do you have to have a refractometer? You don't have to, but it's the only way to know for sure uh, if your honey is properly cured. Generally speaking, if the bees have capped it, uh, if they've sealed that honey with that layer of capping wax, generally speaking, they have cured it sufficiently. Uh, but again, that's, and, and more often than not, that's, tr that's true. Uh, but I have talked to people that have extracted capped honey uh, and had some problems. But uh, generally speaking, if the bees have capped it, they've cured it sufficiently, and so you shouldn't have a problem. And uh, you can use some of those other tricks that I, I, I discussed earlier uh, if you don't want to get the refractometer. Um, 
When is the sour wood flow in your area? It's just coming to an end. It uh, it started. It starts about the last week of July or last week of June, first week of July, and it's coming to an end. But frankly, this year uh, we didn't have much of a flow. I had more honey on my hives uh, at the beginning of the flow than I do right now. I went through them this past weekend, and and I need to start feeding. There's nothing on those hives. Um, uh, when using an escape screen, do the empty supers have frames in them? Yes, because if you didn't have frames in them, they, the bees might start building comb and create an awful mess in there. So put some frames in there. Uh, oh, oh, that's uh, that's a comment about what bee goat smells like. We'll just I'll just say that it smells really bad, uh, and this person supports that. Um, do you have to worry about escape screens? Uh, leaving honey unattended with small hive beetle? That's a good question. Uh, and it brings up another point that I failed to mention. First off, let's, uh, let's address your question. Those escape screens are only going to be on there uh, for, what, maybe uh, two, three days. Um, so you're going to get them off before hive beetle really has a problem. But two, uh, or has a chance to become a problem. The other point, though, is that when you put that escape screen on today, let's say, those supers are not empty immediately right now. So over the course of those two or three days, you still have some bees in there as time passes, less and less bees, but you still will have some bees in there sort of torment those hive beetles and prevent them from really becoming a problem in those supers while on the hive. Now, if you leave it on there for a while, they could become a problem, but also if you leave it on there for too long, the bees will begin to figure out that little maze, uh, that triangle maze, and make their way back up into the, uh, the honey supers. The other point that really I should mention that I failed to with that escape screen is that you have to make sure you do not have any upper entrances. Um, if you have any upper entrances open, bees will find it and they will get back into those supers, or worse, uh, robbing bees will find that entrance and rob those supers out. So make sure you seal up any cracks, knot holes, uh, the notch in your inner cover, if you're using our inner cover, anything that may uh, allow bees into those supers, make sure it's sealed up so you don't get uh, uh, a robbing situation. Um, uh, uh, are bee blowers not much use anymore? Bee blowers... Uh, Bee blowers basically, for those of you who don't know, are uh, it's basically a glorified leaf blower that blow blow the bees out out of the the uh, the equipment. Boy, they can really agitate bees and make them angry. Um, I, I'd much prefer uh, an escape screen or uh, a fume pad to a, a bee blower. Um, I have used bee blowers in the past on uh, cloudy days when fume pads weren't working very well, and we need to we needed to get some extra bees out of the equipment. And it really does agitate them. Um, most of the people listening here probably not going to be using a bee blower, most likely a, a bee brush or escape screen or a fume pad. Um, you must freeze uh, comb honey for long, long uh, storage. Yes, if you're doing comb honey, uh, freeze it after you've uh, either in, in the frames or uh, in your containers that you've put it in. Uh, I usually freeze it uh, in the containers, and that will kill any wax moth uh, eggs that are uh, that may be on that uh, on that comb honey. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you've got larvae or, or the adult moth, you're not putting that in your containers. But uh, any eggs you might not see, and if you did not freeze it, they would just have a field day in that that little section of comb honey. So free if you're doing comb honey. Uh, freeze that um, uh, for a long term long term storage. Uh, how many pounds of beeswax in a fully drawn medium super? How many pounds of beeswax? Oh gosh, you're probably talking. I don't know. Maybe just about. A, if if you had a pound, I'd probably say that was a lot because the the comb. Um, maybe you'd have a pound. I don't know. The comb. Uh, the thickness of a cell wall is about the thickness of a sheet of paper. It's very, very thin. Uh, so when you actually, if you were to scrape out all that wax uh, and compress it down, you're not going to have a full lot. Um, you know, I, I used to get off of 10 hives, maybe about, oh, oh I don't know, four, four or so pounds 
uh, of capping wax. Um, uh, so you there's not a whole lot of wax there. Um, rotate comb, uh, uh, rotate honeycomb, same cycle as brood, every three to four years. I would say that uh, with comb, with uh, honeycombs, frames that you're using for honey supers, if you're not allowing brood to be reared in them, uh, you can they last longer, I think, because the real uh, um, issue, one of the I should say one of the issues with uh, with old comb, uh, if it's been used for brood, you have the the increasing potential for American fowl brood, uh, because that's where the, those spores that are going to be re, uh, creating uh, created and collecting, um, because that's where the bees are reproducing. You're not going to have those spores uh, collecting in your honey supers because the bees aren't reproducing there. Now. We know that, uh, unfortunately, bees are bringing back agricultural pesticides to the hives, uh, things that are being sprayed on crops and people's yards and things like that. So you will have some accumulation of those, those contaminants in your, in your honey supers. So you may want to think about rot rotating it out uh, fairly frequently for those reasons, but it's not uh, uh, for, for brood comb. You, Brood comb compared to honey supers, you can go longer with the honey supers. Uh, when I take my, uh, uh, I can uh, down to the height. Uh, can I negotiate more shallow cappings versus cutting it all the way back then? Um, I'm not quite sure the, the question here. I've got a. Let's see here. Uh, it's about a shallow. Alan, can you clarify that a little bit? I'm not quite sure what you, what you mean. How can I negotiate more shallow uncapping versus... Oh, okay, 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 okay. So basically, the comb is drawn out well beyond... Uh, the question is, uh, the comb is, is drawn out well beyond the, the top and bottom bar, if I'm understanding this right, Alan. It's drawn out beyond the top and bottom bar, and rather than using the... Uh, the top bar is your guide for a knife or something and slicing off uh, more wax than you need to. How can you sort of keep that knife or plane or whatever it is away uh, from that uh, top bar to take just the cappings layer? Um, and that just takes takes a little bit of practice. You don't necessarily have to use that, uh, that top bar as your guide. Um, I would say... Uh, Honestly, I probably say that the the cold knife is going to be easier because you've got, I think, mo more control over it than some of those other ones. The problem with uh, with um, those the heated knives or or planes is that they go so quickly. Uh, it it uh, just a a few an inch or so you can be right down to foundation almost because it slices through so easily. Whereas with the cold knife, you're sort of using it in a in a sawing motion, and so you can uh, you can see it a little bit easier what's going on. It's a little bit slower, so you don't have that uh, that that opportunity to cut a little too deep too quickly. Um, uh, but other than that, really, there's there's just no way except for a little bit of uh, a little bit of practice, uh, frankly, uh, or the sideliner and capper. But probably outside, uh, like I said, most of us uh, probably can't afford that. I certainly can. Um, uh, let's see. Uncapping tank. Use cheesecloth as strainer. You can. Cheesecloth uh, works fine. Uh, not quite as um, fine as the uh, nylon mesh that I was talking about, um, but, uh, but works well. Um, uh, so you can use that as well, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. All right. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, I'm afraid I I, I didn't uh, I didn't make uh, my point clear enough about sort of alternating the orientation of the supers when you restack them on your uh, escape screen. Uh, basically, yes, you want to put uh, your first one down as it was when you took it off. The next one you want to turn 180 degrees. So what was at the front is now at the back of the hive. Uh, your next one, 
what was at the front should still be at the front. So they, they alternate, every, uh, every super is 180 degrees uh, from where it used to be, or, or, or uh, relative to uh, the super above or below. Um, and that allows them to clear up that honey. Uh, and, and they'll do that while that escape screen is in position and you're waiting for the bees to sort of move out of that equipment. As they move out, they'll do some housekeeping and clean it all up. Uh, hopefully that's actually a little, a little, a little clearer. Um, uh, how do you measure the moisture level in a frame while harvesting? You can bring that refractometer out to uh, the bee yard with you and actually uh, uh, uncap a cell or two and take some, some honey and drop it on to the refractometer right out in the field if you'd like. Um, admittedly, I, I tend to be uh, a little bit uh, perhaps cavalier. Uh, and trust that when the bees have capped it, uh, it's sufficient, but I always double check that back at the, uh, the honey house. Um, do you want cap both sides? Yes. Um, uh, okay. Um, is, shipping, is, is shipping an extractor expensive? They look big. Unfortunately, uh, Paul, shipping everything nowadays is expensive. I'm sorry to say, um, the uh, it, it, they they can't, especially the motorized can be sort of pricey. The um, most of them we can get through UPS. The 20 frame, which probably outside most of us here, has to go by truck. Um, the uh, the compact deluxe ships uh, in in two boxes. Uh, let's. See. The uh, one box, I'm trying to, I don't have the information right in front of me. It ships, uh, actually, no, I, we get it into one box, but it, 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 it only weighs, I don't know, 35, 40 pounds, but it ships, because of its size, it ships at the 88-pound rate, uh, because UPS and FedEx nowadays and even the post office are using dimensional weight. So basically, they calculate the shipping charges based on the volume of the box, and they take whichever is higher, the actual weight or the dimensional weight. Uh, so so uh, it can be a, a little pricey to ship. What I would suggest, Paul, if you want to know for sure just what it's going to cost, give us a call. We'll be able to plug your zip code in, and we can tell you what, it, what it's going to cost to ship. Um, uh, if you can't buy an extractor, um, you can... Um, you can crush and strain. If you've got wax foundation, you can cut it right out of that frame and actually crush it up by hand and put it into a strainer and let it naturally drain out. Uh, one of uh, the beekeepers here in our office use that, uses that method. You can do uh, comb honey, which we talked about. Um, you can do uh, <laughs> you can do what my father does, who I think is listening right now. Uh, he uncaps uh, where, where they are. They don't have a problem with high beetle. Um, he uncaps a couple frames at a time and just sort of lets them rest in a bucket and the honey naturally drain out. Takes a while um, but and, and doesn't get all the honey out of the frame, but uh, works just fine for the, the two hives that, uh, that he's got. Um, uh, let's see. Do you wire your extraction frames? Uh, generally, I use uh, the, the plastic foundation. Um, so I don't wire because I'm using the plastic. If you're using wax foundation, uh, it is advantageous to wire those frames to give them extra support. You know, in the background here, we've got this, this extractor spinning. Uh, the force that's being exerted uh, on these uh, frames and on the comb in these frames is tremendous and that extra wiring uh, or that wiring helps give that uh, comb some support. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, can you discuss cut comb versus crush and strain? Cut comb basically is you take the, uh, let me find that, this frame, Ooh, get my pointer back. Uh, Come on, there we go. Um, this uh, um, cut comb is you basically take uh, you you actually cut out sections of this, and and you might put it right into a um, into a container. 
into a jar or something. Eat honey in the comb. Whereas crush and strain, you're going to cut this whole thing out, and you're literally going to mash up all the wax uh, and break open all these cells and put it in either pantyhose or cheesecloth or a nylon bag or something like that um, that uh, your honey will drain through and away from the wax. Um, so that's the difference between uh, cut comb and, and uh, crush and strain. How late can you harvest? Um, you can you can harvest pretty late uh, as long as you can get the bees out of the equipment and as long as uh, you can keep your honey warm if it's cold outside. Warm it up so that the uh, the honey can flow out of it. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's. See. How do you feel about using a bee blower or a leaf blower? I've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, how do you? Oh, what's the best way to remove frames? that you plan to harvest if you do not use a queen excluder? That, Robin, is a very good question. Because all the methods that I talked about, uh, with the exception of a bee brush, where you're physically, basically, m moving the bees off the frame, but the escape screen and fume pad, you're sort, of a, you're, you're sort of putting something in place that allows for the bees to passively move off of those, those uh, frames. And bees if there's brood present, are reluctant to leave that brood behind. So if you put a, an escape screen in place, the bees are reluctant to, pass, to leave the brood behind to pass through that escape screen. Same with the fume pad. Even though it may stink like mad inside that hive, they'll be reluctant to leave that brood behind. Uh, so if you've, got, uh, if you've got brood in there, that's a bit of a problem. A bee brush uh, to... You could use an escape screen, you could use a fume pad, uh, and, and maybe uh, in conjunction with that, a bee brush to get rid of uh, the rest of them. If you've got a little bit of brood in your frames that you're going to extract, uh, that's okay. Uh, it's just a little extra protein for you. Uh, it's not the end of the world. Um, let's see. Uh, um, in the north, is it okay to wrap? Uh, empty frames and plastic over the winter. I want to store the uh, store in a in a dusty shed. Um, what I what I would do is uh, I'd be concerned about moisture. If you wrap them in plastic so that uh, you can get some accumulation of moisture, uh, I would. I, uh, uh, you're in in Massachusetts, I believe. Is that right? Um, there, you're going to get cool pretty early enough. That if you stack them up, uh, and uh, after they've been cleaned out by the bees, um, you should be all right if, if they're uh, in an unheated uh, shed that'll get cold fairly quickly. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily wrap them. I would just try and maybe put a, a top, uh, like a telescoping top on, on there to keep the dust out. <clears throat> How much room do uh, bees, bees need to survive in the winter? Uh, this is my first year. I did not harvest, I did not harvest any honey off my two hives. Each hive has two or, or rather three or four supers currently. Um, if you were, this is a, another good point, if you leave uh, honey supers on your hive for those bees to overwinter on, be sure that you do not have a queen excluder between the brood chamber and that honey super. Because going through winter, what might happen is the bees may attempt to get into that honey super by passing through the queen excluder to get to the honey. And in doing so, they may actually abandon the queen down in the brew chamber while they're all nice and roasty toasty with honey to eat up in the honey super. And so you could do your hive some damage in that, in that way. Um, so if you're overwintering with honey supers on, make sure you pull off your uh, queen excluder. Um, I would, if you've got three or four supers currently, I would, I would try and get some of those off. Um, uh, you want to have uh, about um, anywhere from 60 to 80 pounds worth of honey on your hive. Um, so you can leave maybe one uh, if it's full and it's a medium super uh, and it's a 10 or a 10 frame with nine frames in it. You're looking at about 40 pounds of honey there. Um, and, and then sure, I would guess that they, they would have the, you know, 20, 30, maybe 40 pounds in a double, in two double, 
in, in two deep brew chambers uh, that uh, they can overwinter on. But you want about 60 to 80 pounds, but I, I wouldn't leave them all that space. Generally speaking, too much space is, is not good for them going into winter. Uh, what's the best way to clean the mess after extracting uh, and settling? If you've got an extractor or an uncapping tank, what I do is I wash things with cold water first. Uh, and what that does is it, it sort of flakes any wax or propolis off the equipment. If you use hot water, all that happens is that wax and propolis gets sticky. Uh, and so it doesn't really flake off your equipment. It sort of oozes and smears on the equipment. So cold water first, that gets all your solids, your wax and, and propolis off the equipment. And then you can uh, wash it up with warm water to get any residual honey that may be present. You can also just take all this stuff outside and let the bees, again, away from your colonies, let, let the bees clean it up. Um, and uh, that works very well also. Um, when I say empty supers under an escape screen, uh, empty supers with frames. The, uh, they can be drawn or undrawn. It better if they're drawn because then they can start storing honey right away. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so first year beekeeper not expecting to harvest honey this year. Some uh, some have said I shouldn't use a queen excluder. Do you agree? With brand new equipment, when you put a honey super on top of your brood chamber, I do not recommend a queen excluder until the bees start working those frames and drawing out wax and storing nectar, maybe even raising a little brood, but don't put a queen excluder in there first off. It will be a sufficient barrier to print prevent the bees from getting into that new equipment. Uh, can I use a hot knife on a plastic frame? What is your opinion on plastic frames? Uh, what, uh, what about super frames? I like plastic frames. You can use a hot knife on them. You do have to be a little careful because it can get hot enough uh, to melt that plastic, so you want to stay clear of it as, as best you can. Um, but if you're uncapping fairly quickly, uh, generally speaking, it keeps uh, it uh, it keeps the knife or plane cool enough that it doesn't melt the plastic, but it does melt the wax. Uh, so I like plastic frames, super frames. Um, super frames are, are very nice because you get the plastic, the strength of the plastic foundation with the wood frame, which is good uh, because it doesn't have any hiding places for small high beetles. Uh, uh, so this person's just saying that, um, uh, that honey uh, likes to absorb moisture. Uh, if you live in a humid area, uh, you may, uh, and leave your honey open, that it can actually absorb uh, some of the moisture from uh, the air and, and bring it over that 18%. That is true. Um, so if you're in one of those areas, uh, you, you might want to uh, extract it uh, and put it in airtight containers um, or keep it someplace maybe with a dehumidifier to keep uh, the humidity low. Mm. Uh, 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 Darren, the best time to get started with a new hive is uh, first thing in the spring. We start taking orders for bees as do most places February uh, in, in early February. Uh, that's when you want to secure your source of bees. Uh, this person's starting a, a new hive. That's when you want to secure your source of bees and uh, get your equipment thereafter, but you've got a little bit of time before those bees will be available. Uh, but order early, uh, and that way your colony has all spring and summer to build and get ready for winter. Uh, let's see. When Rob, what percentage of honey do you recommend, Rob? Uh, so this person's just simply asking, how much honey should they take from the hive? Uh, um, that, that's a personal preference. Uh, you can take it all, but you're going to need to feed them. Um, you, you need to have 60 to 80 pounds worth of honey on that hive going into winter. Um, so you can either feed them sugar water or corn syrup if you take too much. Uh, so a percentage doesn't really work. Uh, this year, um, taking, you know, 80% of, of nothing still leaves me with nothing, which is what I've got on my hive right now. So I'm looking at feeding. Uh, the sourwood flow never materialized here. Uh, 
Does the Bego need to cover the entire top of the Super? Um, some people say that uh, if you leave a little crack, uh, that you'll get some airflow, uh, and it'll sort of create a little bit of a vacuum, uh, to, and, and the, the fumes will settle down through the, the Super a little faster. Uh, it depends a little bit on the conditions. I usually just uh, put it on tight uh, and let those fumes settle down through. Uh, yeah. Why do you need to feed if there's honey in the brood chambers? Um, I don't have much honey in my brood chambers right now. Um, like I said, there, there's less honey on that uh, hives now uh, than, than uh, before the sourwood flow. Um, so I, I need either to feed some, some honey back to them or, or um, uh, feed them some sugar water. Uh, when, does the honey stink when you use a fume pad? If it's high enough concentration, you can actually detect it a little bit uh, in the honey house. Yeah, especially with the, the, the Bego. Um, so you do have to be a little careful. Um, do you sell an... Uh, so this person wants to know if we sell an upgrade to our, our hand crank radial extractor to a motorized. Yes, we do. Um, it's a conversion kit. Uh, we've got it in our catalog. Um, you're welcome, Forrest. Uh, how do you get honey out of cappings? Good question. Uh, so the honey will sort of drain if you're using an uncapping tank like I showed or some sort of roasting pan. The honey will sort of drain out from those cappings and you can put it in a knot in pantyhose and a, you know, cheesecloth, whatever it is, and let that honey sort of drain out. Um, you're never going to get it all. Um, and so normally what I'll do before I process my cappings, which is another conversation for another day, um, I'll usually take it and, uh, and bring it outside and let the bees clean it up and, 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 and clean out those cappings and get, uh, most of the honey out of it. Uh, ah, same question, right in a row, two different people. How do you, uh, clean an extractor after processing? We already talked about clean up a little bit. Uh, okay, that's interesting, claiming as much wax. Okay, situation is that uncapping an extracting house is interesting in claiming as much wax. Ah, so, so I did understand the, the question about uh, trying to uncap the frames that are well beyond the, uh, the top bar. Um, yeah, is you just have to sort of get a whole practice there, and, and you can just take that thin layer. Uh, uh, can you review the use of the uncapping fork? Uh, you can, the uncapping fork, let me see, I'll jump back over here. The uncapping fork, where is it? Uh, basically what you're going to do is take these tines and, and, and just slide it right underneath the cappings. So, um, all you're doing is, is just, and then lift up on that fork and, and all you're going to do is just lift the cappings uh, like little hats off the cells. You're going to lift those little cell cappings right off the top of the, the cells. And then you can just set it, um, you can set it uh, in a container. If you've got, actually, you know, you can take those um, uh, roasting pans, and a lot of them have uh, like a, a metal grate that sits in the bottom, so your roast isn't right on the bottom of the pan. You can put a frame in there, lay it laying down on one face so the honey slowly drains out. Uh, through that that grate into the into the pan, so that that works pretty well, uh, it, and that's you can certainly do that. It takes a lot of time, but uh, very inexpensive method of getting liquid honey. Uh, what about bubbles in the honey? Uh, gravity usually takes care of the bubbles. Um, if it's if the warmer it is, of course, the faster those bubbles will come to the surface. Um, uh, Um, uh, so top bar beekeepers will, will tell you that cheesecloth is way inferior to nylon fabric, uh, as, uh, as is knee nylon socks, perfect solution for straining. Um, yeah, che cheesecloth, I've never really been very impressed with cheesecloth. I find it sort of gets a little bit, uh, fabric, I guess, fabric fibers, uh, in, in the honey sometimes. Uh... Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
should I definitely expect to extract honey from first year from hives, or should I be prepared to leave the bees with everything uh, to overwinter? We tell folks your first year that you probably won't get honey. Uh, but in reality, uh, you definitely can your first year. Um, but again, I just emphasize you want to leave enough on those colonies for those bees to overwinter, uh, and that's about 60 to 80 pounds depending on where you are. Uh, if, if you get uh, a honey super that's jam-packed and you've got sufficient honey down in your brood chambers, by all means, you go and get that honey and bottle it up, and, and it's going to be the best stuff you've ever had. Um, uh, so, this, so this is a good question. Extractors typically have three legs. Recommendation uh, of mounting to floor. Um, uh, so uh, most people, uh, I think, are, are going to be extracting, well, maybe in their kitchen, uh, maybe in their basement, uh, somewhere in their house, and really bolting and extracting uh, an extractor to the kitchen floor, not going to go over too well. Uh, what you can do is uh, if, you, if you get a pallet, uh, which is a little bit better, bolt it to the pallet. And what that does is it sort of secures the, the extractor to the pallet. Then as you're extracting, you stand on the pallet, which adds weight to essentially to the extractor and can help stabilize it. But if you can, if you're doing it in your garage and you don't mind uh, uh, thunder studding it to the concrete floor, uh, you can unbolt it later and move it out of the way and then just keep those, those thunder studs in place and bolt it down again uh, the next harvest. That certainly is, is the best way to do it. Um, but a pallet works very, very well. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, so this person wants to know how soon our, our branch, our warehouse in Pennsylvania will be ready uh, to start shipping. Uh, well, Greg, I'm going to be up there the first two weeks of, of August uh, helping to get that set up as well as going to EAS. Um, and uh, we're just trying to get it up and running as soon as we can. But uh, I'm going to hesitate on, on actually putting a date on it other than to say um, we're, gonna, we're shooting to have it up and running before uh, next year um, and hopefully before that. Uh, if you can't buy uh, an extractor, Join a local bee club that has one. Uh, yes, that's true. A lot of bee clubs uh, uh, rent, some, sometimes for free, sometimes for a nominal uh, fee. Uh, an extractor that you can use either at their facilities or one that you can take home and use at your house. Also, uh, uh, an association, and sometimes there's a member there that uh, will negotiate, you know, I'll, I'll take, you know, 20% of the honey and extract it for you. And they keep the honey and, and give you back the 80%, you know, whatever the case may be. But there's usually deals that can be made uh, if you're part of an association and save on the cost of, uh, of an extractor. Uh, how long do you leave the empty frames to be robbed out? Um, they, uh, they'll have it uh, robbed out in about a day or two, depending on how much you've got uh, in those frames. But they, they make short work of it. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, and this year I let the bees clean up the comb uh, when they're, they're hungry. So, so I, I've got uh, my father posting in here saying that, uh, uh, that he's, that's how he's harvested his honey. In other words, uncapping and let it, letting it drain and then letting the bees sort of clean it up. Um, so it does work well. Uh, you'd think, you know, you would think a guy who manages a bee supply company might be able to set his father up with an extractor, wouldn't you? Um, does the uh, uh, deluxe extractor handle different size frames? Um, the deluxe extractor will, uh, the compact deluxe, uh, I assume that's what we're talking about, uh, will handle four uh, shallow or medium-sized frames or two deep frames. Um, if uh, you're talking about the nine-frame radial, it will handle uh, nine medium or shallow frames or three deep frames, but it does them tangentially. So here's the picture uh, come on, uh, of that. What happens is there's a, uh, a wire basket that, let me get some things out of my way. There's a wire basket that sits in here across this way and, and one deep frame fits in each one of these uh, compartments here. So, but it does them tangentially. 
if you're using deep frames. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, when would be the best time uh, uh, to harvest uh, day as well as time of day? Uh, I, you can harvest, you know, I harvested back at the end of June. Uh, if I had a sourwood crop, I'd be harvesting now. You can harvest uh, at the end of the season um, in August or September. It all depends a little bit on your weather uh, and things like that, whether you want to do it multiple times. Generally, most people were coming into the full swing of harvesting season uh, for the better part of the U.S. Um, so July, August, September. Um, I, I can't give you a specific date, but uh, time of day, uh, uh, early afternoon would be good because you're, the sun's going to be high in the sky if you're using a fume pad. Um, if you're using a bee brush, a lot of bees will be out foraging. Uh, so you won't have to contend with them in the hive. If you're using an escape screen, go out uh, early afternoon, put it on, and go back early afternoon to, uh, uh, you know, a couple days later to, to pull those supers off. Um, is it possible to see here past webinars? Uh, yes, it is. Um, let me show you how. Uh, I've got it. Uh, here's our website. If you click on uh, Resources, Video library. Uh, we've got some videos here as well as all the recorded webinars and hopefully by tomorrow you will see uh, harvesting and extracting in this spot right here. Um, so that's where you can find them. Uh, ah, does a queen excluder need to be removed prior to implementing a B screen or fume pad? I would say it's certainly, it's not required, but it does help move the process along a little bit. A lot of times the, uh, the bee escape goes in the same place, same position in the hive as the queen excluder. Certainly a, uh, a queen's not going to pass through one of those bee escapes. Um, and if you're using a fume pad, it's sort of a pain to unstack all your supers and then restack them and then put your, to, uh, unstack them, get the queen excluder out, restack them, and then put your fume pad on. But uh, it, the, the bees will move out of those supers a little bit faster if that queen excluder isn't in place. Uh, let's see. Do you leave honey supers for the bees to eat during winter, or do you just uh, leave what's in the brood chamber? Again, uh, 60, 80 pounds, however you got to get it. Oh, gosh. Boy, I botched that. I thought you were in Massachusetts, all the way up in Maine. So, uh, you Coastal Maine, actually, uh, my my wife's from from Maine, and coastal Maine can uh, can um, stay fairly moderate because of the uh, the ocean influence. Um, but you should be okay. It, it, keep those supers outside. Um, how do you dry the honey if the moisture content's too high? That's a good question. Uh, you can keep uh, if it's in capped uh, frames. You've got that seal of the wax preventing uh, any real moisture from coming out of that honey. Uh, so I would uncap it um, and uh, and and then keep it in a dehumidif or uh, in a in a confined space with a dehumidifier. Uh, they do actually make honey dryers, um, but again, I think those are probably outside the scope of most people listening. Uh, your best bet would be to uh, put it in like a closet or something like that with a dehumidifier to try and dry it out. Um, uh, how far away from the, your hives if you're letting bees clean out um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the supers? I usually keep them, uh, you know, maybe three, four hundred feet if possible. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this person's just getting started. They only have one hive body. Um, you want one hive body. You might be able to get by, but chances are you're probably going to need more honey and or syrup in that uh, brood chamber for them to overwinter on. So I, I'd start feeding if you only have that one one hive body. See if you can't build them up into two. Um, uh, what can be done about with plastic frames after they've been used and no longer have wax in them? Uh, is, uh, I'm assuming when you say plastic frames, we're talking about the one-piece uh, plastic frame like we've got, like we've got here. Boy, 
Uh, let's see, frames. Um, whoops, I can't quite see. I got some extra stuff here. Um, like these. Uh, you can actually uh, re-wax these, these frames. Um, and I actually just gave a talk at the North Carolina meeting uh, regarding that. And let me pull, I can pull that up real quick. Um, you can take a, uh, take some of your, your wax and melt it down. And let's see, here we go. So here's a little double boiler I got going with a foam brush. This is a, a sheet of that plastic foundation. That I'm just painting on the wax. And what happens is, um, is it just collects at the top rim of the cell. Uh, it just, and, and it's right where the bees need it to begin drawing out the wax. So you can re-wax it. Scrape it down and, and re-wax it if you'd like. Um, that's, that's a very good solution to reusing these frames. Um, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 so, okay, so this person has an English garden hive. They've got two uh, of the eight frame medium uh, supers, uh, which are, we use as brew chambers, um, and a queen excluder between the second and third uh, uh, super. Um, that, that's, uh, typical configuration. Uh, David, you want to make sure you've got, uh, about 60 to 80 pounds, depending on where you are. You can get away with less in the south, more in the north. Uh, you may want to, you may need to leave a third one on there for, uh, additional honey going into winter. Uh, can the moisture content of honey be too low? Uh, it depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, if you're trying to cream it, yes, creamed honey, I think the ideal is about 17% moisture, too low, and it doesn't cream very well. But uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Uh, let's see. When you first get started, how long before your first harvest? Uh, Joan, can't say. Uh, this year, uh, if you got started this year and, and you were my neighbor, um, you probably wouldn't harvest anything this year because we've had such a bad flow. Uh, other parts of the country, you may be able to harvest, you may have been able to harvest now. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say when your first harvest will be. There's just too many variables to sort of, um, uh, put a, put a, uh, a finger on it. Um, with the weather and rain, has this affected the moisture content of honey? That is a good question. Um, the bees are very, very good at regulating the environment inside their hive. Um, and so really what, regardless of what's happening outside, the bees are, are pretty good at taking care of what's happening inside the hive. Um, so even though it may be, uh, rainy weather and, and such outside, they can dry that honey usually sufficiently inside the hive. Now, if it's, if it's all summer long, Humidity is up, you know, 75% every single day, all the time. They're going to have a difficult time, but rarely is, does it persist for that extended period of time that they'll have a problem. Um, and so they should be okay. Uh, they should be able to cure that honey. Uh, with, uh, so we've got a person here that uses a 55-gallon drum with a little paramoth to store their super frames. Uh, um, it holds a lot and works well for me. So that's a great way to store, uh, to store frames if you've got a 55 gallon drum. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this person's, the last couple of questions about rainy weather have all been on the East Coast. The first one was in New Jersey. This one's in Maine. Uh, East Coast has just been bad year for honey production, I think, pretty much up and down the East Coast. Um, what if you have too much moisture in a frame before extracting? Um, you can uh, extract it and immediately make mead with it uh, because there you're going to, you, you want it to ferment. You could um, extract it um, and, and freeze it, which would delay 
the fermentation process and perhaps feed it back to them at a later time. Um, you could leave it in a frame and freeze it to delay the fermentation and feed it back to them at another time. Or you can just leave it on the hive or put it in a super and return it back to the hive. Or put it with your other equipment and let the bees rob it out. Uh, there's lots of different options there. Uh, uh, can you feed the bees a 50-50 sugar water mix during the spring and summer and then harvest honey and what quality will you get? Uh, you, you'll get sugar water or, or corn syrup, whatever it is you're feeding. Uh, if you're feeding um, and they're putting that in your honey supers, you're not going to end up with a very good quality honey. It'll, it'll be basically sugar water, concentrated sugar water. Or, or corn syrup. So if, if you're trying to get honey off that colony, you need to stop, you need to stop feeding. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. Um, why the poor sour wood flow? Uh, it's one of the, the whimsical ways of mother nature. Um, you know, we had some say that when you have a wet spring, which we certainly had, and then a, a, a dry uh, spell when the sourwood's blooming, you get, get a good flow. It's been pretty dry during the sourwood bloom, uh, but we didn't get a good flow. Um, it hasn't been very hot. The hot uh, weather generally helps with sourwood, but um, maybe that's it. Uh, I just, just don't know. Uh, Mother Nature's a, a funny thing. Uh, let's see. Or, uh, um, how long will it take for bees to clean up the equipment? If overnight, uh, will raccoons be a problem? Generally not, uh, but they might be. Um, I've never had a problem with raccoons uh, bothering my empty supers, but then again, I've never really had a problem with raccoons. Um, so, uh, you'd probably be okay. Um, uh, let's see. If you, uh, if you have uncapped honey in the frames at the end of the summer, what do you do with it? Uh, you can, again, you can extract it, uh, and save it to feed back, uh, to the bees as long as you can prevent it from fermenting. You can, uh, just take it and let the bees rob it out and they'll store it back into their brood chambers. You can leave it on the hive for them to overwinter on. Um, all depends a little bit on um, what you got going in your colony and how much work you want to want to put into it. Uh, have a honey, hummingbird feeder that the bees have found. Is there any way to deter them? Uh, generally speaking, um, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, David. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Darren. Um, I think, I think uh, that that's the end. So quick, quick, before there's another question, uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank all of you uh, for attending. And... Um, uh, we'll talk again soon, hopefully in the future. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.